Today, I want to talk a little bit about what it takes to actually be successful as a technician in the technological live events industry. I hope you like it. Welcome to the Intentional Success Podcast, where we unpack the top strategies, explore business trends, and drill down into best practices to help your live events production business grow and scale on purpose. I'm your host, Tom Stimson. So I, I'm like everybody else. I, I've learned how to be a show technician on the job. Um, on the job training is where it came from. There was no schools for what we did, except that as a young man, I grew up doing theater and I started doing theatrical shows when I was eight years old. I acted on stage. I ran lights, learned how to run follow spots, you know, playback sound bits, move scenery, um, you know, all the things that you do in a, in a play or a presentation. Um, so I kind of grew up in that world. And so I already had a, an innate sense that there was things like, you know, timing and finesse about how you presented to an audience, how the audience had a chance to perceive you, um, and that you could change a mood with lighting. You could change a mood with sound. You could change a mood with silence. So we had so many wonderful tools in our hands to to manipulate the audience into um, having the experience that we wanted them to have. Now, fast forward many years later, you know, and we were, you know, you know, we were u- using candles and rubbing sticks together to create light when I started doing theater. But you know, move forward, and you know, after college, I discovered audio visual, discovered AV, I found out about projectors and things like that, that other ways of creating light and projecting images and um, different kinds of sound systems, um, recording, lots of utilitarian meeting work. But it wasn't until I'd been doing meetings for a year or so that I finally found myself in the middle of a show an actual show using audiovisual equipment. And it was interesting because the people I was working for, the AV company, was the classic AV convention conference rental company with, you know, hundreds of tripod screens and hundreds of overheads and hundreds of sure SM57 microphones and sure M68 mixers and all this really uh, pretty low end equipment uh, compared to what you saw in music and entertainment and theater at the time and we're slapping these things together and they have all these goofy little boxes to try to create you know attenuators for signal matching because they they didn't know how to use the proper tools and i'm sitting down with all this equipment in front of me that i'm going to operate for the client during this event and this client just happened to be a a New York producer who had experience on Broadway and calling shows and everything. And here he found himself dealing with what I affectionately call meatball AV, but this was really meatball AV. And he was fearful. He was quite concerned that, you know, he, you know, had this young kid who didn't know anything about shows, didn't know anything about cues and timing and that, you know, you know, we had to bring the lights down and bring the sound up and then segue over to the video playback and get the slide off the screen so the video could go on the screen and handle all of these things. And I'd already been sitting there studying what it was I was going to do. And I knew I had to hit five buttons in a sequence of about, you know, eight seconds to make all of these timings worked out. And so he explained to me what he wanted, I made a few suggestions about, well, because the roll up on this is, takes too long, why don't you let me do that? And then we'll move, do that cue. And he understood. And we went through all of that and got through the opening with, you know, you know, or the first time we rehearsed it, I should say, got through this opening sequence. And he goes, you've done this before. I said, no, sir, I've just grown up in theater and I understood what you're asking for. But the fact is, AV people didn't know how to do shows. Um, that was not something we did. We we flipped the switch on. We never turned the dial up, right? That was that was the general sense of things. You just made the equipment work and let the show take care of itself. 
So that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how do people learn technology today? Because back then, and this is the early 80s, um, you could learn all the technology there was to learn in audio visual and gosh, God, like an afternoon. I mean, it just wasn't that complex. And, you know, video back then was really kind of clunky. Um, and we were using, you know, RF cables. So we were basically hooking up TVs, TVs, you know, a, a video deck was just a TV antenna output to a television, which was our display. It wasn't very complicated. And if you could figure out, if you could find matching connectors, there was a really good chance you were going to get a signal through. Uh, doesn't mean it would be a clean signal, but you would get a signal through. So it wasn't a complicated business to learn. But the act of doing shows and making things look presentable was an art that just I didn't see a whole lot of. Right. Learning how to, you know, dress the drape up, learning how to move a potted plant in front of this piece of equipment that was going to be unsightly, um, straightening out the skirt on the stage, dressing the cables, making the cables where the audience didn't see them, and, and certainly making them safe for people to walk over, you know, having safe areas to walk backstage so that, you know, talent or presenters didn't trip over things. Um, there were so many little things we do, lighting, Lighting was simply, you know, you threw up a, a par can or a, even a lapsoidal up on a pipe tree and you just opened it up and you shone it at the stage and it's going to wash over on the screen. It's like, wait a minute. Do you guys not know, you know, what these flaps are for, what these louvers are for? Uh, do you not know that if we put it at this angle, uh, we can alleviate some of that glare? So there are so many things, but it made it look better for the audience. And that's what that's what technicians needed to learn, because we could learn the equipment very quickly. Now, what became interesting is that over the next decade, 15 years, the decade and a half, the, the technology did get very complicated. It got very hard to use. Uh, we had broadcast video equipment getting dumbed down for industrial AV, um, having video engineers and we had people with, you know, oscilloscopes and waveform vector scopes, um, setting up equipment, very complicated video projectors, sound got harder, wireless mics were, were sorcery, right? So all of the technology got harder. And as the technology got harder, we got technicians instead of show people. So there was this brief period where it's like, hey, if I could teach people how to do a show, the technology was easy. And anybody with a, with a, who'd been around high school AV equipment could do a show if they could do shows. And so when I started my first company training people um, to be audio freelance audio visual technicians, I was more focused on how to do the show than how to learn to do the technology because that wasn't hard. But after turn of the century, training became very much about how to use the technology. And the idea of doing shows was something that you would pick up as you go. And I think we suffered a lot for all of that, that we had a lot of people who weren't really good technicians. And we started to see the difference between a quality national level technician who was not only good technically, but they knew how to do a show. Right. And that's what became very, very important. But as trends happen, <laughs> All of a sudden, technology got easier again. So once we've moved out of the analog world into the digital world, pretty soon, anybody could set up a video projector. Anybody could scope a camera. We didn't need all this broadcast um, knowledge and sorcery and magic to figure out how to make things work. So now we had a space for entry-level technicians who actually could do things with these fancy processors and doing, you know, multiple picture and pictures and programming things and programmable lights and all, all this stuff, which I personally cannot do and never learned how to do because I was three generations behind in technology. And these people came in and once again, they're setting up these giant LED walls, but they've never done a show in their life. 
they've been responsible for making the equipment that was used in the show. So here we are. How do we develop show technicians that we desperately need, people who will do and say the right thing in front of customers, who will smooth over the technological glitches, because that's a lot of what a show technician does, is makes the technology not apparent. How do we train those people when the standard is, do you know how to turn this on? Do you know how to get a picture out of it? Well, you know what? Pretty much any eighth grader can <laughs> turn on the video projector and get a picture out of it. Um, and some can probably do a lot more with it. Um, kids grew up with the stuff. They grew up with computers. They grew up with apps that control things. Um, the technology is not the hard part anymore. The hard part, once again, is doing shows. And when I, as I'm thinking about my younger clients in terms of business owners, um, and some of them, you know, may have been in business for 20 years, but they came into business at a time where the technology was pretty easy to pick up and the quality of technicians started to get a little bit squishy um, because so many people could do this. Oh, yeah, I know how to do that. Yes, I know how to program that. Sure, but can you actually do a show? Can you do the things that are going to help the audience experience what the buyer wants them to experience? And that seems to be the lost art. That's the thing that, that I'm worried about. Um, how are we going to create that? Because the generation that should have passed that on, I don't think we did it. And, you know, I, I, I own some of that. I'm part of that group. You know, how do you learn that behavior? So I want to talk a little bit about that today. I want to talk about uh, shadowing. Very often we bring young folks in and we have them shadow someone or we, or really it goes like this. It's like, instead of, Hey Tom, I want you to come in and shadow Bob and learn how to do this. It's really, Hey Bob, this kid, Tom's going to shadow you, teach him how to do something. However, it comes about, <laughs> you know, shadowing is how we learn behavior. And we often think that the shadowing is about how to learn the technology. But the technology is easy. Somebody can learn the technology on their own, ask a few questions. But the behavior of doing shows is what's hard. Behavior is where the freelancers we hire succeed or fail. Oh, I can't use that guy again because of their behavior. So shadowing behavior is you have to see what the appropriate behavior is before you see the difference between the behavior you would have shown otherwise. And I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example because this is something that's been a pet peeve of mine for many years. I have the privilege of dining in a lot of fine dining restaurants. I get to go to a lot of great places to eat. Thank you very much. Um, but the quality of the food and the quality of service together is what makes it fine dining. You can get good food a lot of places. Sometimes you can get good service, but good food and good service together. Wow, great, wonderful evening. Um, have you ever had gone to a really nice restaurant and had really mediocre service? Think about those experiences when you have that. What I typically find, what I typically observe is that I have a, not necessarily a young person, but very often a young person who has never had a fine dining experience themselves. They find themselves because they're clean cut and well-spoken working in a nice restaurant, when in fact they've never eaten in a nice restaurant. They don't know what fine dining service is supposed to look like. Therefore, they've not shadowed, they have not learned the behaviors they have not learned the nuances of interacting, of how to read a table, to provide the, the service that's appropriate. And, you know, fine dining is mostly about what you don't say. My wife and I were at a dinner one night at a, in a resort town um, with a very earnest young man who wanted very much to give us a fine dining experience. Um, and he, had, he will get there one day, but he had too many words. So... Every time he, he was at the table, there was a whole litany of things he wanted to make sure that he communicated to us, which is basically the opposite of that experience. Um, but he was well-meaning. We had a nice time. <laughs> we kind of chuckled every time he came up to find out what else he was going to um, impart upon us for our, for our evening meal. But 
the fact is he'd not seen it done. And if he had seen it done, I think he would have quickly picked up and go, oh, I don't need to say that. Oh, I'm not supposed to pick up their glass. I'm just supposed to reach over and pour into it. You know, he would have understood about, you know, I, I take both plates at the same time, not pick up her plate because she's done eating and come back and pick up his plate. And the little things like that that you notice in fine dining, I don't want to unbalance or disrupt the experience of these people here having a meal together where food and drink magically appears and gets taken away when it's done so that they can enjoy their time together and not have to waste time or disrupt the rhythm and flow to interact with the technician, which is the waiter, which is the server. So, Getting people to do shows when all they know how to do is operate the equipment is a challenge. We, they have to shadow. We have to be willing to commit putting someone next to an experienced show operator so they can see what's done, so they can learn about headset etiquette, so they can learn about timing and nuance, um, how to read a room, how to interpret what's going on, how to uh, work with the other departments who are also executing cues, um, how to work with a good show caller, how to work with a bad show caller. You know, these are things that, that experienced technicians understand and they manage to avoid the kinds of problems, and this is important, that the audience will see. There's always going to be problems. There's always stuff going on that's there to trip you up. The game is how do I keep the audience from seeing it? So training technicians is easy. Doing shows is hard. You know, how are we going to make more opportunities for people to learn the art of doing the show? So there's no substitute for experience, but seeing it done well is a better teacher than any book you could ever read, any lesson you could ever give. If you've seen it done well, you'll either understand it and apply it, or you won't, which is fine. We have lots of roles for qualified technicians, but there may not be what we would call the big show people, the people that know how to handle themselves in the bigger show environment where the stakes are higher. Um, you know, people whose careers are on the line are getting ready up to go on stage and make the most important presentation of their lives. And they need people behind the technology who understand all of that and smooth the way to their success. So a couple of tips. I just wrote down a couple of things that I, I remember learning that were important in my journey to become a better show technician. Even though I'd done shows, I had some knowledge and understanding, but we make mistakes and there's a teaching moments. Uh, I remember once when I was working at a facility, and it wasn't a big fancy show or anything, but um, I stuck my head out from behind the curtain, and the stage manager admonished me, pulled me aside, and said, we never peek around the curtain. How many of you have peeked around a curtain to look at the audience from backstage? That is that's horrific. That's horrible. It's unprofessional. I'm embarrassed to tell you a story that I did that, but I was young and I learned from it. And honestly, I never did it again. Um, we learned about why we wear blacks. We wear blacks not to be seen. Show blacks are about not being seen. Very often, I see people wearing show blacks to identify themselves as part of the show crew. In fact, People at front of house would never wear show blacks because people at front of house are there to be seen. So you dress appropriately for front of house, which is to dress as well or better than the audience. And if that means you're wearing a coat and tie or even a tuxedo, that's what you would wear front of house. And while that is not the standard that I see applied much anymore, it does diminish the audience's view of the value of the person behind the console or the desk. If they're wearing a golf shirt with a logo on it at a gala banquet where everybody's in black truck tie and evening gowns, um, well, not only do you look like the help, <laughs> um, 
you're not you're not going to get the respect that you need to do your job well and you're probably not going to be appreciated as well and in my opinion you are actually distracting from everyone else you have, you know the whole point of wearing blacks was to blend in if you work backstage it's dark you blend in the whole point of wearing a coat and tie out of front of house is so that you would blend in so whatever is appropriate for the audience you should blend in and that's what we taught and that's how i was taught um so um protecting the audience experience right sometimes it's convenient for you to maybe cut across this way or you know slip out from behind the curtains to get to the front of the house rather than going back around and through the service hallways and all that but that's how I, I was taught to be as inconspicuous as possible because if i have to go through the audience unless it's critical that something has to be touched you know technology out in the audience has to be touched we don't want the audience to see us they don't want to see us rushing to do something um we were supposed to go through the back hallways um and then another thing that's very important and i think it's i think it's probably the most important lesson because it touches on everything about shows and etiquette and timing and customer experience and respecting the technology and respecting the media is that the reason we have faders and knobs is because we're supposed to slowly move through the attenuation that they come with. We never flip something on. You never flip the lights on. You never slam the faders up. You know, you always crescendo into something. And this applies to not just things about doing shows, so many things in life is that if you impact something, sometimes your message is lost due to the sudden change in the energy that distracted everyone. So again, slamming up a fader is hitting an audio cue too hard, not fading it in, hitting a lighting cue not too, you know, that's too hard when it shouldn't be, distracts the audience. And sometimes we want to distract the audience and that's the purpose of it. I get that, you know, I understand art, but most of the time, we're not trying to do art. We're trying to support communication, which means not be a distraction. So understanding that there's subtlety in what we do. And if people realize that somebody just did that, you drew attention to yourself, which means you, you lost the game. <laughs> you lose. <laughs> there's a technician back there. Um, the best compliment I ever got on a show site uh, everything was all over and I came out from backstage. The audience was, you know, you wait appropriately until the audience is 75% gone. And I came out from backstage and I started collecting the equipment and somebody walked up to me and said, I didn't know you were back there. I said, yes, well, I'm the AV operator. I was doing all this equipment. She goes, I was wondering how all of that worked. And I thought, yes, thank you. That's exactly what we're going for. I didn't think, well, gosh, you're an idiot. You think all this stuff works itself. But the point is they did. They just assumed when people walked up to a podium, the, to a lectern, that the, the mic came on and the sound level got adjusted. And when they asked for the video to play, the video just played. It didn't occur to them that there was people behind all of that. And I think that was a very strong testament of two. One, of how ubiquitous technology has become, but two, how powerful it is if we suddenly do our jobs so that we are not drawing attention to ourselves and the attendee, the guest, the diner gets to focus on their experience of what they're trying to get out of it um, rather than your experience and showing all the things that you know how to do. So. Anyway, there's my, there are my thoughts today. How can we better train folks? And let's find opportunities to shadow young people, um, perhaps shadow people who think they are better than they are and they need to see it done better um, uh, so that we can learn how to pass on this art of doing big shows. Because there's lots of little jobs going on every day, but more and more, the longer I'm a consultant, the more I advise people, the more I find that even the smallest companies doing, you know, the smallest jobs think of everything as a show, but they're also 
not necessarily presenting it like a show. They're putting together the technology and we need to improve that human interface between the technology and the perception of the intended audience because that is our real product. Well, we have two real products. One is that human interface and two is all the gap that connects all the equipment, right? So let's get the right people and let's have the right GAC on show site. The equipment seems to take care of itself nowadays, which is, yeah, it's fun and exciting, but it means that we get to focus on more important things, which is the human side of it. That's my two cents. Thanks for listening. If you want to find out more about today's episode, go to trstimson.com slash podcast, where you'll find the show notes, related links, and tons of other valuable resources. If you haven't already subscribed to the Intentional Success Podcast, please do so, and I'd greatly appreciate if you would rate and review the show. Also, if you think you might be a good fit to work together or want more information about the Stimson Group, I'd love to hear from you. Visit trstimson.com for more information.